um, people are requesting to be admitted. I can't say anything. Yeah. <laughs> Waiting for the open remarks. But maybe I should just open my song.
thank you so much. <coughs> Let me take this opportunity to welcome everyone uh, on this important lecture at the Combat Total. We have been trying for a long, long time to arrange this lecture and trying to get an appropriate speaker. And we are grateful uh, that we've got somebody who has agreed uh, to join us uh, and ensure that this lecture uh, meets the standards and the stature that it deserves. And I want to take this opportunity to really welcome and thank uh, Comrade uh, Geraldine. Thank you so much, Comrade Geraldine. We, we really appreciate it. has been a very difficult, difficult moment um, as, a, as a foundation, the Ericola Foundation, to really honor the stalwart of our struggle, a very important person, fearless person, and we felt that uh, there is an urgent need for us to remind South Africans, in particular young people, that our struggle was not free uh, and that there are people that sacrificed and paid the price for us to be free and for us to have a democratic South Africa. As the Foundation would always emphasize uh, that we are influenced and touched by the teachings of Heru Gwala, another fearless stalwart of our movement, a person that we are convinced as a, as a foundation that anticipated everything that is currently happening in our country. Somebody that knew what will happen, the dynamics, the difficulties as, we, as the struggle unfolds, that these are the challenges that we are going to face and meet in life. And truly, we are, meet, we are, meet, we are, we are meeting some of those particular challenges. Uh, so I'm not going to waste time, uh, Comrade Geraldine, uh, Fraser Mlekete. I'll call upon you to come here and deliver this important lecture to our people. Comrade Kerald. Audio is muted. Thank you very much for that introduction to uh, this very important lecture, and I'd like to acknowledge the Harikwala Foundation. But before I start, I'd actually like to acknowledge the Kabi family and say that this lecture is for Ma Aurelia Kabi and for the great-granddaughter of Comrade Joe Kabi. I've entitled this lecture, Joe Kabi, The Enemy Has Struck Us a Blow. At Comrade Joe uh, Kabi's funeral on August 9, 1981, the President of the African National Congress, Oliver Tambo, addressed those gathered to mourn. And I quote, to say, that the enemy has struck us a blow is to tell the truth. He was a positive loss because he was the type of leader who knew how to follow. He was the type of op operative who yielded results. He was a leader who in his sector produced results. And it is the test of leadership to be able to produce intended results. Joe Kabi passed the test with great distinction, close quotes. As we remember Joe Kabi's legacy 40 years on, since his brutal assassination by the apartheid regime, it is important that we reflect upon his contributions as an emblematic feature of our struggle, both as a revolutionary in the struggle for national liberation, but also as an outstanding leader of the ANC and the Alliance as a whole. The story of Joe Kabi includes that of a, previ a previous process of strategic renewal, one which should be interwoven in the approaches we adopt as members of the movement. To honor his legacy is to lead our country through the renewal and unity of the movement. Our governance and leadership cannot be more of the same. 
a nicely worded statement with a list of mechanistic actions to be undertaken. It must be grounded on a fundamental understanding of the political, economic and social challenges confronting our society today. It must be the formulation It seems as though I cannot be heard. There's a problem with sound. Apparently, you need to mute no, all participants and then allow that. I'm sorry that no, I'm no, interrupting no. it. It was no. merely to do that. Yeah. Can you hear it now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can hear well from just now. It must be grounded on the fundamental on a fundamental understanding of the political, economic, and social challenges confronting our society today. It must be the formulation of a tangible program that will yield benefits for society and provide purpose and direction to cadres, because this is what Comrade Joe lived for and died for. As we honor Comrade Joe Kabi's multifaceted life, as a politically and socially engaged figure rooted in democratic ideals towards a just society, we must draw inspiration from his constant efforts towards organizational work and mobilization, combined with his militant statue, stature. Indeed, his first political articulation along with his membership to the African National Congress, as well as its allied Communist Party, he remained grassroots oriented with his seminal investigative journalistic efforts. Let me pause again. There's a number of people who say they can't hear at all. They can't hear anything. And I've got it from a number of people, including the CEO of the SABC. Um, um, are you able to scroll something on the screen to just explain this a technical problem? And it probably means that I have to start from the beginning. <laughs> Oh, apparently I can be heard now. Um, I'd, I'd just like to apologize. It appears there was a bit of a technical problem. And I hope that uh, you can hear me now. Um, uh, I hope you can hear me now. I've entitled this particular intervention, Joe Kabi, the enemy has struck us a blow. I have also said earlier that I'm particularly committing this lecture to the uh, Kabi family and particularly to Antorelia Nomazocho Kabi and his great granddaughter. And I'd like to start by saying that at Comrade Joe Kabi's funeral on August 9, 8, 1981, 
the president of the African National Congress, Oliver Reginald Tambo, addressed those gathered to mourn and said, to say the enemy has struck us a blow is to tell the truth. He was a positive loss because he was the type of leader who knew how to follow. He was the type of operative who yielded results. He was a leader who in his sector produced results. And it is a test of leadership to be able to prove, uh, produce intended results. It's muted again. Is it still muted, Salomsi? Oh, you can hear now. Uh. And it is the test of leadership to produce intended results. Joe Kabi passed this test with great distinction. Close quotes. As we remember Joe Kabi's legacy 40 years since his brutal murder by the apartheid regime, it is important that we reflect upon his contributions as an emblematic figure of our struggle, both as a revolutionary in the struggle for national liberation, but also as an outstanding political figure. The story of Comrade Joe includes that of a previous process of strategic renewal, one which should be interwoven in the approaches we must adopt as members of the movement. To honor Joe Kabi's legacy is to lead our country through the renewal and unity of the movement. Our governance and leadership cannot be more of the same. A nicely worded statement with a list of mechanistic actions to be undertaken. It must be grounded on a fundamental understanding of the political, economic and social challenges confronting our society today. It must be the formulation of a tangible program that will yield benefits for society and provide purpose and direction to cadres because this is what Joe Kabi lived for and died for. As we honor uh, Comrade Joe Kabi's multifaceted life as a politically and socially engaged figure, rooted in democratic ideals towards a just society, we must draw inspiration from his constant efforts towards organizational work and mobilization, combined with his militant stature. Indeed, his first political articulation, alongside his membership to the African National Congress as well as the Communist, South African Communist Party, remained grassroots oriented with his seminal investigative journalistic efforts in the uncovering of the horrors of apartheid. Indeed, he was amongst the first to commit unequivoc unequivocally to the armed struggle. As a result, he was arrested in 1963 and imprisoned on Robben Island alongside leaders of our struggle, such as Walter Sisulu, Nelson Mandela, Governor Mbeki, and Ahmed Kathrada. On the day of Comrade Joe's funeral, the National Liberation Movement was bitterly reminded of how threatened the South African regime was by the effective leadership of our movement working towards the attainment of the national democratic revolution. The extent of the intentions of the apartheid regime in this regard will be dealt with later in my intervention. Shot 19 times 
in the driveway of his residence in Harare, Zimbabwe, the dis dastardly murder of this revolutionary once again confirmed that meaningful revolutionary action would be met with deathly force at any time. In his funeral oration on Comrade Joe Tabi, the president of the ANC, O.R. Tambo, spoke to his exemplary qualities, and I quote, he moved amongst the, among the youth, an organizer of the Youth League. He moved among the workers. He was himself a building worker, and he started and established a building workers' union. That union sub subsequently joined SACTU when SACTU was formed. He has continued throughout to maintain the closest relations with the trade union movement. Joe Kabi took himself to the life of the peasant, peasants. In 1960, the resistance to the Bantustan system resulted in an uprising, a revolt amongst the peasants in the, in the Transkai. Joe Kabi was sent to that area and worked with the peasants in their struggle, and it was the armed struggle of its own kind. He remained there until the enemy had completely crushed the resistance, understandably, close quotes. Let's look at the investigative photographic journalist. And around 1952, Joe Kabi began his investigative efforts at New Age as a journalist and a photographer. His job of exposing the deplorable labor conditions of farm workers in the parts of the country and New Age, the reputation of a voice of dissent at a time when the commercial media was an extension of the apartheid regime. The impact of the New Age was felt by the then Minister of Justice, Mr. B.J. Foster, as he and captured in Hansard when arguing for the passage of the General Law Amendment Bill in the then apartheid parliament, Foster regarded The Guardian as a mouthpiece and propaganda organ of communists, and that everybody knew its editor, Brian Bunting, was still an active, outspoken com communist. Foster uh, informed the House of Assembly of how the newspaper publishers had managed to outwit the state by noting the moment that the Guardian, uh, the moment the Guardian was banned, it appeared in print and on the streets under a different name, the Clarion. Similarly, when the Clarion, for technical reasons, was forced to abandon its names, its name, it appeared on the streets under the name of Advance. Again, when the publication of advance was prohibited by the state under the Suppression of Communism Act of 1954, it simply changed its name once more and appeared on sale in the streets as the New Age the very week following the ban. The flabbergasted Minister of Justice reminded Parliament that although the old act and legislation laid down that the state could prohibit and ban newspapers that were spreading propaganda, it encountered such problems. These challenges arose because the newspaper publishers exploited existing loopholes. Foster was determined to close those loopholes, presented by, uh, by presenting an amendment bill in Parliament. He made no secret of the fact that one of the newspapers which ought to be banned was the New Age, which he defined to be the House of, uh, he defined to the House of Assembly as the propaganda organ of the banned Communist Party. Before members of the opposition parties could get excited and oppose his intention, Foster read out an, out an excerpt of an article published by New Age to commemorate the Guardian's 25th anniversary. It included a greeting 
from Moses M. Kotani, a former general secretary of the Banned Communist Party of South Africa. It reads as follows. The advent of The Guardian in the South African political scene 25 years ago was an important historical event in the struggle of the working class and oppressed people in this country. The Guardian and its successor advance were suppressed by the tyrants and exploiters of this country because the oppressed people's paper spoke and talked the truth, taught the truth. The glorious tradition and heritage of the Guardian is today be, being carried on by the gallant little fighter, New Age. In the absence, absence of our organization, which has been suppressed, and the people's leaders who are banned or banished by the Firwood government, New Age has become our spokesman and the defender of our cause. Close quotes. Comrade Joe Kabi, along with Ruth First and Wolfie Kodesh, has exposed, had exposed the slave-like conditions on the Bethel potato farms, an expose which led to the historic potato boycott. Comrade Wolfie Kodesh, in an article in Sechaba in 1982, described, and I quote, a gaunt man in tattered clothes walked into his office in New Age. At New Age, the man told a horrific story of st starvation and deaths from exhaustion and whippings on the farm of work bent from sunrise to sunset in long rows picking, picking up potatoes. Kodesh with his colleagues Ruth First and Joe K uh, Kabi immediately drove out to the farm and saw a vision straight from Hades. Scarecrow men, shoeless and dressed in sacks, working with hoes along rows of potatoes. Kodesh noticed mounds in the fields, which he realized were the same <coughs> as those he saw in Ethiopia during World War II, mounds formed by shallow graves, which when kicked revealed corpses. By the time the graves were uncovered, only skeletons remained of people who remained unknown. Photographs by a comrade Joe and articles by Ruth First captured these conditions, which led to the ANC launching the historic potato boycott, involving key figures like the Lion of the East, Comrade Gert Sibande, drawing attention of the country to the harsh conditions <coughs> of the, on the potato farms, which resulted in the stockpiling of potatoes across cities in South Africa. Of noteworthy mention is that Comrade Joe was nominated for the internationally acclaimed Julius Fuchik Medal that had only been won by Governor Becky and Brian Bunting at the time. Comrade Joe proved practically that working hard with the, within the ANC did not reduce his impact or his role as a communist. In fact, he saw the task of rebuilding the, a of building the ANC as part of his work as a communist. In the words of Comrade O.R., and I quote, he was the type of leader who knew how to follow. He was the type of operative who yielded results, close quotes. He was a leader when his sector produced results, and it is the test of leadership to be able to produce the intended results. O.R. further described Comrade Joe as followed, follows, and I quote, by virtue of his caliber as a militant, Comrade Joe uh, Kabi was selected as the first of al-Qaeda's to be sent abroad for military training. 
He was the youngest of them, close quotes. And Kabi was one of the first six MK cadres to be sent abroad for military training in 1961, returning in early 1962 to participate in MK's sabotage campaign. After the arrest of the ANC, SACP and MK leadership at Rivonia, Comrade Joe left the country again and he was arrested with 28 others in what was then called Southern Rhodesia for attempting to leave the country illegally and he was sentenced for two years imprisonment at the time. At the end of the term, he was rearrested and sentenced to an additional 10 years on Robben Island under the Sabotage Act. And I quote, Comrade Joe was then released in 1975 and immediately joined one of the existing underground structures in Soweto. He initially worked with Zwelaki Sasulu, but often sought guidance and uh, advice and guidance on specific issues from Albertina Sasulu. This according to an interview conducted by Eleanor Sasulu. He soon became a leading member of the ANC underground centered around Johnny, John and Kadimen. This structure was also referred to as the main machinery, close quotes. So com Comrade Joe was never to stop. He stepped out at every point. He reached out to young people across the political spectrum. And in the words of Comrade Safiso and Lovu, and I quote, no one forced the youth to take the decision to move into the ANC en masse. They could have gone into the PAC and BCM. He had reached youth across uh, the political spe spectrum. He had the incredible ability to draw people from different sectors of society and across communities and he could adapt to and blend into different contexts. This culminated in the apartheid state arresting him yet again and he was accused number seven in the Pretoria 12 trial. He was one of the six acquitted in 1978 and he then went into exile and was appointed as ANC chief representative in Botswana and ran the MK operations into the then Transvaal. Additionally, he raised funding for the establishment of COSAS. Comrade Joe was also one of six members. He was a member of the political military strategy committee of the ANC that developed the Green Book. And I'll come back to that later. In 1985, the ANC president, when reflecting on the black consciousness, black consciousness movement and the Soweto uprising, said that the ANC had been ill-prepared when the Soweto uprising began. He concluded, and I quote, that this uprising of 1976-77 was, of course, the historic watershed. Within a short period of time, it, propel it propelled into the foreground of our struggle, millions of young people brought into our midst, many of whom had very little contact with the ANC, if any. Organizationally, in political and military terms, we were too weak to take advantage of the situation that crystallized from the first events of 16 June 1976. We had very few active units inside the country. We had no military presence to speak about. The communication links between ourselves outside the country and the masses of our people were still too slow and weak to meet the favorable situation, such as which was po poised by the Soweto uprising, close quote, quotes. Tambo pointed to the role of ANC members and said, and I quote, 
An outstanding role in this situation was however played by those of our comrades who were inside the country, many of them former Robben Island prisoners. Through their contact with the youth, they were able to make an ANC input, however limited, in the conduct of the bloody battles of 1976-77. Among them, we'd like to select for special mention the late comrade Joe Kabi, former Robben Island prisoner, who was assass assassinated because the enemy could see the seeds he had planted among the youth in Soweto in 1976, hardly a year after his release from prison, and in the subsequent years were bearing bitter fruit for the oppressors and for us, magnificent combatants for the liberation of our country. The participation of the comrades we've spoken about in assisting to guide the Soweto uprising once more emphasize the vital necessity for us to have a leadership core within the country, known by us and in touch with the people, dedicated, brave, with clear perspectives, and thus able to leave, lead, close quotes. Separately, and I quote, the 1977 political report adopted by the plenary session of the Central Committee of the South African Communist Party, close quotes, reached the following conclusion on the Soweto student uprising, and I quote, the events in what has become known as the Soweto Revolt are not isolated happenings. They have their roots in the crisis, which had been building up at every level of socioeconomic structure. The intensity of the Soweto events reflects, reflects the developments over years of these people's reaction, of the people's reactions to the growing crisis of apartheid. At the political level, unbroken efforts by our party and the whole liberation movement headed by the ANC maintained the spirit of resistance and helped lay the foundation of the growth of the heightened revolutionary mood, which was in evidence. And among large numbers of new militants thrown up by the, act, by the activities, there's a growing awareness of the liberating ideas of Marxism-Leninism and a search for the correct politics of social revolution, close quotes. So inspired by these changed conditions, the ANC leadership saw the urgent need further to intensify the struggle to overthrow the apartheid regime. As part of this, it sent a delegation led by President Oliver Tambo to the Socialist Republic of Vietnam to study the experience of a struggle which had defeated the powerful US imperial, imperialist hegemon. In October 1978, a joint National Executive Committee and Revolutionary Council meeting that took place in Luanda from 27 December 1978 to 1 January 1979 um, it received the report of that delegation to Vietnam. After discussing the report, the meeting observed amongst others that, and I quote, the Vietnam experience reveals certain shortcomings on our part and draws attention to areas of crucial importance which we have tended to neglect, close quote. Quotes. It was then decided to establish a committee to draft a document on what the movement should do in the light of the lessons drawn from the struggle in Vietnam. This became a commission of the six members I referred to earlier, headed by O.R. Tambo, that included Tabumbeki, Joe Slovo, Moses Mabida, Joe Kabi, and Joe Mudisi. The commission, known as the Politico Military Strategy Commission submitted its report, popularly known as the Green Book that I also referred to earlier, to the ANC in August 1979. This signaled a shift in the debate 
amongst ANC leadership on our approach to waging a people's war. And built on this, the deliberate and conscious decision by the ANC to deploy Comrade Joe Kabi as chief representative to Zimbabwe was to build, in order to build relations with the Zimbabwe government led by ZANU. A particular challenge in this regard was the, that the ANC had had a historic alliance with ZAPU. As stated by O.R. Tambo in his, uh, in his uh, eulogy on 9 August 1981, and I quote, Joe Kabi was capable of making friends across political and ideological barriers, across color lines. He communicated with ease and effortlessly with generations young and old, close quotes. After all, he was a member of the group of six of the Green Book and he was the right person for Zimbabwe at that point in time. His mission was to build a solid fraternal relationship with the ZANU government and this he did successfully. The success was evidenced years after his assassination when Zimbabwe would be the country to host the Organization of African Union Subcommittee on Southern Africa, which adopted the Harare Declaration in October 1989. Led by President Tambo, the ANC leadership drew up this declaration to prepare for negotiations with the apartheid regime. And we should recall as well that this was after the last underground South African Communist Party Congress in Matanzas, Cuba, where it had adopted its program entitled The Path to Power. So then let me go to others and their reflections. And I'm going to choose an interesting person, James Saunders, allegedly a member of MI5, British, who wrote, and I quote, on 31 June, July 1981, the ANC representative in Zimbabwe and new, newly appointed deputy head of intelligence, Joe Kabi, was assassinated outside his house in Harare. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission later reported that Kabi was killed by a South African hit squad acting on the basis of intelligence supplied by the agents of the Military Intelligence Division of South Africa operating from within Zimbabwe's Central Intelligence Organization. The Military Intelligence Division agents were Colin Evans and Philip Hartlebury. They were later exposed and after interrogation, confessed to their role in Kabi's killing. In 2004, the Johannesburg Sunday Times announced that Gray Branfield, also referred to as Major Brian, worked uh, uh, age 55, had been killed in Iraq, where he worked as a security contractor. The author Peter Stiff confirmed that Branfield was a former detective inspector in the British South African police, who had joined the Barnacle Death Squad after moving to South Africa in 1980. Branfield had privately revealed that he was one of the assassins who had murdered Joe Kabi 23 years earlier. It should be noted, as I continue this quote, that testifying before the TRC, Major General Hubert, the officer who commanded the special forces between 1985 and 1989, disclosed that in the mid 80s to late 80s, probably 1986, Barnacle was transformed in this, into the Civil Cooperation Bureau, Bureau, CCB. The CCB was intended to engage in clandestine and covert operations within South Africa. Joubert li listed the task of the CCB as the destruction of ANC facilities and support services and the elimination of ANC leaders and activists, sympathizers, fighters, and people who supported them. 
The report continued. Mr. Christopher Fennell, who was the CCB head of intelligence, explained that the CCB was a long-term project which, was, which required at least a 10-year gestation period. The goal was to create a global subterranean network of companies that would be both legitimate businesses as well as fronts for operational intelligence. Joe Fester, uh, he was Major General PJ Fester, or Joe, confirmed the long-term nature of the CCB project. He described the goal as setting up a first line of defense outside the country. The intention was that the CCB would be fully functional sometime in the mid-90s. Based on the experience of other intelligence agencies, it was recognized that it would take long for a skilled soldier to transform her or himself into a career business person, close quotes. These are the words from an author that collated it from people who served at different levels of the intelligence and defense apparatus at the time. Peter Stiff in his book, Cry Zimbabwe, says, and I quote, in late 1980 or early 1981, it was decided at the highest level of the South African government that the ANC's top 50 externally based officials should be assassinated. In the first instance, it was ordered that they would be tackled as targets of opportunity. But it was later changed to ensure that prior authorization was always sought first. The general assassination operation was coded, Operation Mitsa. The first approved target was Joe Kabi, and the attempt to assassinate him was codenamed Operation Mixer. Close quotes. We are aware that the first failed attempt in Zimbabwe was on the 24th of February 1981, when placing, uh, when a car bomb device that was placed was foiled on detection by a train cadre, Shadrach Ganda, who lived with us in the house in Ashdown Park. Comrade Joe Kabi was out of the country at the time. Five mon months after, the, after this uh, foiled attempt, the task was passed to Project Barnacle, and four teams were tasked for the operation, according to Peter Stiff. The specific operation was started from Tuesday, the 6th of July, 1981, until Friday, the 31st of July, 1981. On the 2nd of August, Team 3 arranged the exfiltration of Major Brian, as he was called, his team, and they boarded a light aircraft at Nduma Airport, Airfield and flew to Messina. I then quote Peter Stiff again when he said that in May 1996, a South African recce, recce team raided Harare and blew up the ANC's main office at 16 Angwa Street, Harare. They also raised the 19 Eves Crescent House to the ground, close quotes. So let me go to the funeral where we were amongst the mourners when OR said, and it rings true as we review this information today, as when he said it, and I quote, his, isolation, his assassination, however, is not an isolated act. It is, as the enemy himself says, 
part of a total offensive as leaders of the ANC against the liberation movement in all its contingents in South Africa, a bid to destroy all. It is part of a campaign of terrorization in this whole region, a refusal to acknowledge the independence of African countries, an attempt to defeat that independence. It is part of a struggle for the survival of racism and colonialism in Africa. It is part of the imperial offensive. Therefore, there will be more Jokabis to bury. There will be more Chimoyos, more Kasingas, more Sowetus, close quotes. The question arises today, 31 July 2021, whether the reactionary forces, as described by uh, Christopher Mnell, who, as I indicated, was the then CCB head of intelligence and described, as I quoted, the CCB was a long-term project which required at least the 10-year gestation period, close quotes, whether this was indeed dismantled. And it begs the further question whether op operatives like Major General Jobert, the officer who had commanded the special forces, and Major Joe Fester, uh, and their networks, amongst others, were these machineries completely dismantled during our transition to democracy? Or could they be the kernel of counter-revolutionary forces that the ANC strategy and tactics document warned of in 1997 when it said, and I quote, counter-revolution can be defined as a combination of aims and forms of action that are mainly unconstitutional and illegal to subvert transformation. These actions also entail underground efforts to undermine the country's economy, including investor confidence and currency, deliberate acts of corruption not, uh, driven not merely by greed, sabotage of, programs for de of the program for delivery, wrecking the government's information systems, illegal and Im uh, malicious acts of capital flight, and so on. Uppermost in the immediate objectives of these counter-revolutionary forces is to disorganize, weaken and destroy the ANC, the vanguard of the National Democratic Revolution, both from within and from outside its, its ranks. It is in the interests of these elements that the masses of our people should be left leaderless and rudderless and thus open to manipulation against their own interest. In this sense, therefore, the democratic movement will be committed committing a monumental blunder, a historic error of great proportions to lull itself into a false sense of security. Maximum vigilance is required. Counter-revolutionary mobilization can only take root if there are real grievances to exploit, whether these grievances are deliberately engineered or not. The democratic movement itself needs to be vigilant at all times that its own actions and omissions do not assist in such mobilization, close quotes. We said that in the strategy and tactics document at the 50th conference in 1997. And I'll return to this. So throughout his life of struggle, Comrade Joe did his best to help ensure that the organizations of which he was a member, the ANC, the South African Communist Party, and the trade unions were strong and principled and characterized by members driven by a high sense of integrity and a selfless commitment to serve the people. Since the t uh, December 2017, 54th ANC 
national conference. The leaders and members of the ANC have spoken repeatedly about the need for unity and renewal of the movement. And the national conference explained specifically why it was important to renew the ANC. And I will give some excerpts and my full speech will be made available so you will see the complete quotes and text and mind you all my references. But let me quote and say, there's a loss of confidence in the ANC because of social distance, corruption, nepotism, arrogance, elitism, factionalism, manipulating organizational processes, abusing state power, placing self-interest above the people. Even the strongest ANC supporters agrees, agree the sins of incumbency are deeply entrenched. Many organizations and thought leaders have become critics of the ANC and its leadership, and we are losing much of our influence and appeal among students, young intellectuals, and the black middle class. And there are also leadership weaknesses and loss of integrity characterized by the comp competition to control state resources, factionalism, conflict, ill discipline and dis uh, disunity, and the use of state institutions to settle differences. Slate and vote buying have delivered leaders who have difficulty driving our programs or commanding respect from society and our supporters. Close quotes. Most certainly, this is not the ANC of Joe Kabi. To truly honor him requires that we ask ourselves the question, what should we do? What would Joe Kabi have done to renew the ANC so that it becomes like the ANC which led our country and our people to, liber to liberation? Inevitably, inevitably, in this regard, we have to look at the quality of today's members of the ANC. The then ANC SG, Comrade Gwede Mantash, delivered a diagnostic organizational report at the June 2017 ANC Policy Conference. And amongst others, he had this to say, and I quote, the consciousness of an individual can be influenced by the material conditions one finds him or herself in. We owe it to ourselves first, the movement and society to analyze in details the implications of a liberation movement that has ascended to power and therefore controls huge resources. And I'll jump to another part. The use of money to buy votes for elections in the party is at the heart of the decline of the quality of structures across board. Money has replaced consciousness as a basis of being elected into leadership positions at all levels of the organization. The ethical behavior of leaders is no longer an issue as it has been replaced by status. Ethics is seen as an elitist approach in politics and has developed social distance as an effect. Social distance accelerates the growth of the trust deficit between leaders and society, leading to decline of support of our movement, close quotes. Let me go back to 1997, when much earlier at that ANC National Conference, President Mandela also addressed the matter of quality of ANC members when he said, and I quote, a number of negative features within the ANC and the broad democratic movement have, have emerged during the last three years. One of these features is the emergence of careerism within our ranks. Many among our members see their membership of the ANC as a means to advance their personal ambitions to attain positions of power and access to resources for their own individual gratification. There are also those among our members who see our movement for national liberation 
as a mere political party which participates at elections at the conclusion of which it places its members in remunerated position of authorities, close quotes. We recently also saw members who are in elected positions talk about salaries to those elected positions as being a job. It's sad. Joe Kabi was not this kind of a, uh, was not this kind of member of the ANC, SACP, or Mkonto Wesizwe. And neither were the other comrades who were his comrades. And they were not part of factions. It was not factional slates that took them into particular positions. In legislatures, provincially, well, nationally, provincially, and at local government level. He sacrificed and he gave his life and what we see today and the excuses given are unacceptable. And it therefore seems clear about what should be done to renew the ANC. The ANC must take steps to ensure that it produces members who are like Joe Kabi. Together they must restore the ANC to its historic mission as the hope of the masses of our people, no longer one in which the people has lost confidence. Those who are genuine revolutionary Democrats and loyal and principled uh, servants of the people will have to work out what should be done to achieve this, these goals. What is clear is that if the ANC does not carry out this process of renewal, it will perish. What is also clear is that the ANC can only seriously talk about its unity during and after its process of renewal. The renewed ANC should also look seriously at what needs to be done to further the national democratic revolution free from the paralyzing and distorting influence of factions. You are either with me or against me faction. And if you're not in the given faction, you will not be considered. It cannot be. And this includes the agents who infiltrated the ranks of the movement to achieve objectives set by the apartheid regime. And they know themselves. One of the questions we may ask today is who is reaching out to the youth? Who is providing leadership to the youth and recognizing their, self, uh, self, their intergenerational role? And to the youth, are you the Joe Kabis of the Youth League of yesteryear? And be the Joe Kabi of the youth of today. Joe Kabi is the e essence as a political fighter that is perhaps best captured through what Fanon described in The Wretched of the Earth, and I quote, to educate the masses politically does not mean, cannot mean making a political speech. What it means is to try relentlessly and passionately to teach the masses that everything depends on them, that if we stagnate, it is their responsibility and that if we go forward, it is due to them too. That there is no such thing as a demurge. That there is no famous man who will take the responsibility for everything. But the demurge is the people themselves and the magic hands are finally only the hands of the people, close quotes. Do we as political activists resonate in this way with the next generation? Or is our membership of the movement seen simply as a requirement for person, personal career advancement? To connect with the legacy of Comrade Joe Kabi means we must work to ensure that the generation born in our democratic dispensation must be grounded on the understanding of the continuity of a political program and leadership. It also means that simultaneously the new generation must achieve a fundamental understanding of the political, economic and social challenges confronting our society. 
today more than at any moment, as part of our renewal as a movement, we need the likes of the Joe Kabi who taught and lived with the youth, who lived amongst the peasants, who lived amongst the workers. And in the words of O.R., Joe leaves a record in our struggle which will be surpassed by few. He was certainly a seasoned leader of outstanding ability. I will conclude at this point. At times, it's easy to be overwhelmed by the challenges we face. However, it's important that we take a moment to recall efforts made during the most trying of times to achieve our democratic dispensation. Reflecting on the life and death of Joe Kabi starkly reminds us about the bitter confrontation between revolution and counter-revolution. These two forces represent on the one hand the hopes of our movement and our nation and on the other the perspective of fear and despair. This, task, this contrast obliges us always to assess how we conduct, uh, conduct the process of renewal and leadership. The counter-revolutionary forces are not an abstract specter. They are active agents with an agenda which seeks to amplify and exploit disagreements and tensions in our movement to reverse our progress and divide our people. Now, whilst the counter-revolutionaries may be clothed in our colors and speak our language, their process is to divide us and defeat the democratic revolution. They flourish in the space created by factionalism, factionalism and the absence of progressive leadership. And be wary to name them too soon because those sitting amongst us claiming to be the progressives may well be those who were part of an earlier project. Let's not overlook that. So the National Democratic Revolution is more than the attainment of democracy. It is about creating a better life for all. Many in our country, including in people in our ranks, never, have never understood the import of the objective stated in the national constitution of building a non-racial and non-sexist South Africa. It is obvious that such a South Africa would require a fundamental socio-economic transformation of our country, starting with the eradication of the legacy of colonialism and apartheid. This is exactly what the Alliance united to achieve as a joined hands to ensure the victory of the NDR. The recent attempts to put on high pedestal some as though this is something new to ally the alliance, and here I refer to radical economic transformation. This is not new. So I want to talk about, as I end now, when I uh, reflect on the decision taken by the apartheid regime at the beginning of the 1980s, the late 70s, to eliminate the top 50 externally based leaders of the ANC. Joel Kabi, as we know, was the first victim of that counter-revolutionary decision. In the material by James Saunders in his books, Apartheid's Friends, The Rise and Fall of South Africa's Free Secret Service, indicates the plans for counter-revolution. And he points to the fact that, and I quote, counter-revolutionary mobilization can only take root. He points to the fact, he points to the correctness of the strategy and tactics document that I quoted earlier, and I won't um, repeat that. But I want to say, the biggest worry is whether the current challenges within the larger movement allowed these forces enough confidence to intensify the offensive, to cause more damage than they have already done. That damage 
has included the weakening of the institutions of the democratic state, including those in the criminal justice sector, the virtual destruction of state-owned enterprises, the subversion of progress towards a better life for all the people, the alienation of our country from the rest of the continent, and the weakening of the alliance organization and the democratic uh, movement as a whole. Comrade Joe paid the ultimate price on 31 July 1981, 40 years to the day today. And we can also mention many others whom the apartheid regime has mur murdered. And I'm going to mention simply three others. These include Dulcie September, it includes Ruth First, it includes Jeanette and her six-year-old daughter, Katrine Schoon. And what was their crime? The crime was that they were determined and principled combatants for the liberation of our country. Thus did they become targets of the decision described as, and I quote, the tasks of the CCB, the destruction of ANC facilities and support services, and the elimination of ANC leaders and activists, sympathizers, fighters and people who supported them, close quotes. Today we remember a revolutionary comrade, Joe Kabi, who was assassinated because of his commitment to the victory of the National Democratic Revolution. Posthumously, he was admitted to the honored ranks of the Order of Lutuli in Silver for his excellent contribution towards a non-sexist, non-racial, just and democratic South Africa. Our leader and our comrade Joe Kabi sacrificed his life so that future generations should continuously enjoy an improving life in a non-sexist, non-racist, just and democratic South Africa. And we must ensure that happens. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Comrade Ger Geraldine Frizambegeti. We truly, 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 truly appreciate this well-delivered lecture, faultless, clear, and presenting something that makes us to question ourselves, to say where we are today, is it what Comrade Joe Gabi died for? You summed it brilliantly when you declared that our current challenges faced by the ANC is the battle for competition to control the resources of our country. Thank you so much, Comrade Geraldine. I also want to thank the Joe Kabi family, the Heri Kuala family, and everyone that has been on this platform. From our side as the Heri Kuala Foundation, today marks 40 years when the apartheid regime brutally murdered our revolutionary stalwart, Comrade Joe Gabi. We felt as a foundation we can't ignore and keep quiet on this important day. That is why we felt that we need to organize this lecture and get somebody that has been working very closely with Comrade Joe, but somebody who understands because of a position in the business sector, in the academia, international matters, to come and share her experiences on who Comrade Joe Gabi was and what Comrade Joe Gabi represented and what we need to do to duplicate the work of Joe Gabi. And it's quite clear that Comrade Geraldine delivered this lecture faultless, flawless, meticulous, but most importantly, perfectly. As she has indicated, We'll make this document available in all our progressive platforms and share it so that our young people must know our freedom was not free. 
were led by brave men and women who ensured that we get the freedom that we are enjoying today. I want to sincerely apologize for the earlier technical faults that affected our speaker, but also affected certain platforms where this lecture was delivered. We want to apologize and indicate that it's not the way that we want to treat our speakers or to treat those that are enjoying or are joining us on these platforms. Let me thank the organizers of this lecture and also thank those that have made contributions on how this lecture should be conducted as well as future lectures. We are indebted to you and we want to thank you for all the contributions that we've made. But we want to thank the family of Comrade Joe Kavi. We want to thank the relatives, the organization that he represented and was part of, and all those that felt that it was very important for this day to be observed and for us to honor Comrade Joe. I also want to thank Comrade Geraldine for the flawless lecture, but most importantly, how it was delivered. It was touched, it was clear, precise, and it was a call for action for us to remedy the challenges that are currently within our beloved movement, the African National Congress. I also want to thank the Herikwala Foundation, the team, and everyone that has been involved on this particular lecture. We can't get tired to thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, and everyone that was on this platform, we really thank you for participating and being part of this crucial day, the day the apartheid regime felt Joe Gabi must leave us. Thank you so much for your participation. We truly appreciate it.